Welcome to the Retro Hack Shack. I'm Aaron Newcomb. Recently I picked up an Apple IIc, and something interesting that you may find hard to believe is when I first started getting into uh, collecting retro computers and fixing them about two years ago or so, the very first pro thing that I bought was an Apple IIc. Now, not only was that the first thing that I bought to kind of start me down my retro collecting path, it was also the first Apple product that I ever paid for with my own money. I have never owned an Apple product before. Not an iPad, not an iPhone, uh, not an iPod, not an Apple II <laughs> back in the day. That was the very first Apple product that I've ever bought with my own money. Now, the story of why that is uh, goes back probably too far and is too long for us to tell right now. Uh, but it is kind of interesting that that was the first thing. The reason that I went ahead and bought it was because it was an area of retro computing that I hadn't explored yet. Well, I recently picked up this new Apple IIc and it needs a little bit of work. So I thought what we do today is take a look at what was happening around the time that the Apple IIc was released and then take a look at this Apple IIc itself, see if it needs any repair. It's certainly going to need some cleaning, as you'll see in a moment. That's coming up right now on the Retro Hack Shack. So before we take a look at this Apple IIc, I thought it would be interesting just to take a look at a little bit of the history um, of the Apple IIc, when it came out, what were the circumstances, what else was going on, that kind of thing. And as you can see here in this uh, timeline of the Apple II family on Wikipedia, you know, Apple, the Apple IIc was essentially the fourth revision, I'm going to say, of the Apple II. And of course, the Apple III. We're not even going to talk about the Apple III. Number one, it's a three and not a two, so I don't feel like I have to count that. Um, but the Apple III was basically a business class, business class Apple II, and it didn't do very well. And the Apple IIc was released at an event called, I believe it was Apple II Forever at Moscone, maybe, um, in 1984. And this was just a few months after the Macintosh was released. Um, so, uh, you know, which people probably remember the um, the big Super Bowl commercial for the Super Bowl, and then Macintosh came out in January. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. And so this was really just a few months after that, like three months after the Macintosh was released. Barely had time to build any sales, although Apple had primed the pumps on the Macintosh, and I'm not even going to go into all that um, uh, sordid history, but uh, you know they were claiming that they had sold all these Macintoshes and stuff. What a success it was. Of course, that was Steve Jobs' baby at that point. He had taken over the Macintosh team, but um, the Apple IIc uh, was released um, at this event called Apple II Forever. And they even had a catchy theme song that went with it. There's a great article you know, on the San Francisco Chronicles. I think this is in the archive somewhere. It's from uh, 2017. But um, they actually found some of their pictures from the event, the Apple II Forever event. And uh, I highly encourage you to go through this. I'll try to put a link in the description below so you can look at these pictures if you're interested in that event where the Apple IIc was released. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was that, uh, you know, initially Steve Jobs got up beforehand, uh, kind of in, towards the beginning of the event, and went through how great the Macintosh was doing and how many units they had sold. And um, one of the things he called out, and I think this is important, is the, um, the, the, the platforms that he was comparing the Macintosh against were the IBM PC, which came out uh, towards the end of 1981, and the Apple II. So he's saying these are the big platform, you know, the big systems of the day, right? Where the IBM PC and the Apple II. And I think that that lends um, a hint as to why they came out with the Apple IIc, which was smaller and more portable. Um, 
But the other thing that I found was really interesting is down here, uh, you can see in this picture. Yeah, so so John Scully got up to speak and he's kind of, he had this long talk and he's building up to the introduction of the, the Apple IIc. And you can see in this picture down below, they actually had planted Apple employees in the audience and they had Apple IIc's with them. And when John Scully kind of gave the, the word or gave the hint, they all stood up and held up their Apple IIc, I guess, to show off how portable it was um, and how light and blah, 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 you know. So um, it was kind of, kind of a gimmick at the launch event, but I just thought it was interesting. And uh, somebody, I guess, Gary Fong from the from the Chronicle, at least that's who who's got the credit for the photo, captured this moment where they all stood up and held up their uh, their Apple IIc's uh, showing off how portable they were. So I don't know. I just thought it was kind of, kind of interesting. Now, um, the question is, you know, with the, the, uh, IBM PC being so successful and it has all these expansion slots and people seem to like that. And there's a lot of third parties making expansion boards for the uh, IBM PC. And then the Apple II, uh, even before the IBM had expansion slots, that was one of the big things that people liked about the Apple II was that it had all these expansion slots. So it's kind of interesting that they released the Apple IIc, which didn't have any expansion slots. Um, but they kind of built in a lot of the peripherals into the unit. Um, it's kind of interesting why they did that. And I think the reason why is because IBM around the same time frame had just released the um, PC Junior. Yeah, so the IBM PC Junior was actually released the month before that in March of 1984. So, you know, if you were sitting back then, you know, this day and age, if you were or that day and age, if you were sitting there, you probably heard rumors that IBM's coming out with a, a new box that's going to be more fam family friendly. Oh, he's just yakking on a bone. He got it up. He's all right now. You can imagine there must have been rumors going around that IBM was going to release this uh, other or next line, essentially, of their uh, PC that was going to be more for families. And so I'm sure Apple was concerned about that, and they had probably gotten some rumors. This was just announced a month before. And um, yeah, so when you think about it this way, it kind of makes sense, right? Because so if you look at this, this is a smaller box. You know, it was meant to be the new family-friendly personal computer. And so you can kind of understand maybe this was probably the reaction, you know, Apple's reaction was, hey, let's take the Apple II and shrink it down and we'll make that the new family friendly uh, Apple II line. So let's just take a look at the way Apple played this up in one of their commercials um, shortly after the, uh, the launch. This is the new Apple IIc. This is a computer they call Junior. You might think they're similar, but this one can only run this many programs, while the Apple IIc can run this many. The Apple comes with its disk drive built in, so it's much smaller. Even the price is small. Now, which one would you rather take home? The new Apple IIc. And you can also see this in some of their ads at the time. It seemed like they were focusing more on the family, more on kids using this. So um, you can see this is one of the ads why every kid should have an Apple after school. You know, they they focused a lot on education. Of course, there was a lot of Apples in the classroom at this point and uh, educational software and so forth. So it seems like they were really fo trying to focus anyway on, on kids and making this a family Apple II. Um, you can see with this other one, you know, obviously some people say this is targeted at kids. It's not really targeted. It's this tongue in cheek, right? How to talk your parents into parting with $1,300, which was pretty cheap, I think, at the time for this system. So they were really, I think, uh, trying to beat IBM at their own game, which IBM kind of failed at their own game <laughs> with the PC Junior. This is how many parents all across America find out about the Apple IIc. Parents buy their kids an Apple IIc because Apples are the leading computers used in schools. Then they discover how easy it is to set up and use, how it can help them with things like business and home finance, and how that can help them spend more time with their kids. Hi, Dad. But yeah, even though the PC Junior didn't last very long, um, at least according to Wikipedia, it says that it was actually the best-selling computer 
Uh, I think in 1984, this would be. But anyway, it says here that, uh, you know, it was outselling the Apple IIe and IIc by four to one in some stores. Uh, let's see. It looks like they sold an estimated 240 to 275,000 PC juniors. And uh, again, the, the, it depends on how you look at things, but the Apple IIc... Uh, according to Wikipedia, I think it said it said it was roughly about four hundred thousand over the course of the four years that the Apple IIc was around. So um, yeah, kind of interesting how these uh, competed against each other. Um, let's go ahead and take a look now at the actual hardware. So this is the Apple IIc that I found at my local e-waste uh, place, and uh, yeah, you can see it's pretty pretty rough around the edges. It looks like it's been sitting at a shop or something. Um, yeah, it needs a lot of work. Uh, the nice thing is it's all in one piece and it also came with the associated uh, monitor, or at least I found the monitor at the same time that I found this uh, particular 2C. I don't know if they went together, but uh, it came with the uh, the original, what was it, nine inch or something, uh, monochrome, green monochrome monitor. And it's also in pretty rough shape. This monitor definitely is going to need a retro bright treatment. I mean, it's really cute, but it looks like it was sitting uh, maybe behind a drape or something, and the sun only got to one side of it. So it, I kept thinking that there was a shadow on the screen when I was recording this, but actually, nope, that's just the, just the uh, yellowing on one half of the monitor. Even though this monitor is small, it does have a nice set of controls. It's got a dial for contrast, a power button on the other side, and in back it has a full suite of centering and adjustment knobs so that you can get everything set up just the way you want. All right, so let's take a closer look at this Apple IIc. First thing I want to test is the keyboard. It's a little crunchy, but I think it is the nice Alps switches under here. There's different types of Apple IIc keyboards. There's Alps and a few others, but the Alps one is 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 the nice one. You can tell it's got the nice little bump. If I press down, boom, it's got a nice little bump there. So really, actually a really nice keyboard for a computer this size. Um, looks like everything kind of works. Uh, I thought one of these was a, oh yeah, there it goes. Uh, so there may be some issues here because that shouldn't go down that far. Um, so maybe this has been pressed down so too much or something like that. Looking at the disk drive. Oh, there's a disk in there. <laughs> Summer games. That'll be fun to test. That'll be a great test disk, actually. I didn't realize there was a disk in there. Never looked at it. So anyway, that mechanism seems to work pretty well. Let's take a look at the ports on the back. So the ports on the back are labeled pretty well. First of all, we have a composite output that's right in the middle. Here's a place where you can hook up another disk drive. Uh, over here, we have a monitor out for an RGB monitor. There's a uh, serial port here that you could hook up a modem to. Over here, we have a mouse port. Then we have a printer port and a power port. You can tell that one is uh, uh, the male to female is swapped on that one, so you can't mix it up. The on off switch is in the back. The handle is really nice because the handle comes down. And uh, this one even has the little spring function still working, but the handle actually can be used as a uh, kind of a ergonomic feature here. So if you put that down with the handle up, it just raises everything up a little bit so that when you're typing, I guess it's more comfortable. It's really not at all compared to a normal keyboard. But anyway, it does make it easy to carry around with you. And if you wanted to, you could uh, prop it up. On one side, you've got the headphone port and the volume knob. This will most likely need to be cleaned with a little bit of deoxid. And nothing on the other side. And here's a look at the back. Um, one thing to note when you're taking one of these things apart, there's some small screws um, that you can see around. And then there's these four screws that you can see make this little rectangle here. These screws, I believe, hold the disk drive in place. So you don't necessarily need to take these screws off to take the top cover off. But if you want to take the disk drive out, you do have to remove these four screws. So let me get started on the other screws and I'll see if we can get this opened up. Okay, now if I remember correctly, there are some clips here on the bottom, but they should just come up. It looks like this one's coming up pretty easily. There we go. 
Alright, got it. And you can push this back and it should come off. There it goes. Just be careful because sometimes this plastic can uh, be brittle with age. Now this handle will come out at this point, so don't lose that. That is the inside of the uh, Apple IIc. So other than the, uh, the disk drive cable being a little loose, I don't see anything at first glance uh, wrong with it. So I'm going to go ahead and take the uh, floppy drive out so we can get a closer look at the motherboard. There we go. So there's the floppy drive. It takes up most of the space inside the case. And now we're starting to see the internals here. So it's amazing to me how this is essentially a miniature Apple II with a disk drive built in. Now, of course, you don't get the card slots, but you know, pretty much all the chips in here, that's fairly similar, obviously, to an Apple II. Power supply, same place you'd expect to see it inside of an Apple II. Um, and then the keyboard up here, but the fact that they were able to get this in this small of a case, essentially it's about the size of a relatively modern laptop. I would say from maybe the oh mid nineties or, or early to mid nineties, about that size. So it's amazing that they were able to pack all of this in here and it's actually fairly clean in here. It's not too uh, dirty at all. The keyboard is pretty nasty. We'll have to take that apart. But other than that, it's in pretty good shape. I'm just going to take the keyboard off to see uh, what everything else. It looks like there's a mod here. Oh, look at this. Okay, let's get the keyboard out of the way so we can see what's going on here. So here's the keyboard. And one thing about this keyboard they had to do was put in this uh, strengthening backer plate um, to help give the keyboard something to to uh, keep it from bending because there was nothing in the middle here that would do the job, right? You just had the posts on either side. So they had to put in this strengthening uh, backer plate here, which um, keeps the keyboard nice and flat. And here's this mod you may have noticed. Um, this has a this has a board in it. Uh, it says Precision Software, copyright 1985. And it goes over here to this little um, button, I guess. It's got a little f fingerprint on it. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of research and see what this mod is. Okay, I might have to do a little bit more digging on this expansion card, but um, apparently this is called a fingerprint card. It was available for the Apple and the Apple IIc. It's got the 6502, which usually goes in here. It's actually up on the board and a uh, custom EEPROM here uh, and a few more uh, logic chips and things. So... Uh, this looks like maybe some memory or something. I'm not sure. But one of the articles I was just looking up on my phone said that this could be a screen capture uh, card of some sort. So I guess you press the little fingerprint button on the side here and maybe it captures the screen for you and then you can print it out on a printer. I'm not sure, but I'm going to put this back in and I'll do a little bit more digging and see if I can figure out what exactly this card does. Well, this doesn't look too bad on the inside, so I'm going to reassemble it uh, most of the way for now, and then we can do a power on test and see if it works. And just looking at this now, I can see there's a uh, a little badge here or a little uh, um, silk screen or label on the PCB that says uh, Photo Circuits Atlanta, I believe is what that says. So that means that these keys are not Alps as I suspected. There was actually two versions of these uh, keyboards that came out, two major versions. One was kind of a, um, I don't want to say no name, but some company, we're not sure who, made these switches for um, uh, Apple. And uh, then there was another one, a second later one that was Alps, and they're quite different. Let me show you an example of what these key switches actually do. So over on Desk Authority, they have a picture of uh, these switches disassembled. And you can kind of see that it looks like they took and cut out and made the, a spring out of this metal plate, uh, which then goes inside the key switch. Now, it's not too hard to imagine that maybe Apple went to a manufacturer and said, hey, we need to have these really thin 
key switches to put in this keyboard. Can you make something? And they, you know, took a look and said, well, we put springs under the keys of most regular keyboards. So maybe we'll just make a mini one and cut it out like that. That's a pretty neat design, actually. Okay, so now I think I'm ready to turn this on and see if it works, or maybe something blows up. It's always a chance, right, with these old systems. So I've got the uh, the output connected so I can record any output that comes on. We should just get the Apple uh, um, text at the top of the screen. Uh, I have a spare power supply. This machine did not come with one, but I have a spare that I bought online. So that doesn't look exactly like the original, obviously. Um, but I've got that plugged in and I've also got the audio plugged in. Won't need that initially. Um, should just hear a beep when this thing powers up. But um, we will uh, maybe use that later if we get to the point where we can load some software on here. Okay, so here goes nothing. I'm going to turn it on, see what happens. Hopefully we should hear at least the hard drive doing its uh, click click on the back of the, the uh, sled here. But let's see what happens. Okay, there's the hard drive. So that's good. I'm not seeing any video though, so that's not good. Hmm. Oh, wait a second. Oh, I just had a bad connection. So yeah, okay, there we go. So now I can see, uh, it says check disk drive, that's fine. Um, a lot of times the uh, uh, the connection on these RCA jacks goes bad, so I'll have to probably fix that. So I'm assuming this is just loose. Let's see if I, yeah, yeah. If I wiggle that connection, it's definitely loose. So that will have to be fixed. That's one thing. I didn't hear anything wrong with the floppy drive, so let's stick in a floppy drive and see if this thing will actually boot something. May as well try this disc that came with this, Summer Games. Let's put that in there and see what happens. Hopefully the keyboard's working. Oh, there it goes. Oh, okay. I don't. I never remember all of the Apple shortcuts on this thing. So I did get it to boot into a uh, prompt so I can actually test the keyboard. So the keys are stiff, but they look like they're working for the most part. So they'll need to be, woohoo! They'll need to be, uh, um, lubricated, it looks like, and cleaned, obviously, but it looks like that's working. Now, what is the command to do the reset without turning this off? I can never remember. There it is. Open Apple Control Reset did it. And it looks like it's trying to read the disk. Hey, look at that. Summer Games. That's awesome, and it looks like we have audio as well. Wow, that's cool. So basically, we've got a complete working system here, except for one little issue, which is the uh, common thing that goes wrong with those RCA connectors, so I can fix that, and the keyboard needs to be cleaned. Other than that, it looks fine. I'm also going to go ahead and clean the floppy drive, but otherwise, it looks like this thing is working. Awesome. You don't like winter games? Okay, so when I went in to take a look at this plug, um, I expected that the uh, the shielding here would be loose. I'm not sure if you can see this uh, this joint right here, where the grounding connects to this uh, uh, connector that connects it to the board. Um, but a, a lot of times that comes loose, and, and you can kind of spin it around. This is nice and solid. So I think that the um, the inside of this jack was just a little bit dirty. And so, uh, and maybe a little loose. So what I did was I just uh, pushed this down. You can see this is the um, connection that goes through to the center pin on the RCA jack. And what I did was I just pushed that down a little bit and bent it, um, you know, just a little bit so that it would make more solid connection with the, uh, with the plug itself. So I think that's going to do it. Let's see. Let's go ahead and plug it in and see if uh, 
if we get any issues here. Nope, no issues. Comes right on. Um, and I can wiggle this around. I'm not getting any, any, I'm not losing sync or signal at all. It, uh, it's just working just fine. So I think it was just a dirty connection. So really that's all there was, uh, for this particular unit. Sometimes you find one like this that really doesn't need any work. And that was certainly the case here. Okay. So all the basic hardware so far checks out, but I do want to test the monitor and make sure that works as well. So I've got this thing connected. I don't know if you can see the, how long this cord is. That surprised me when I took a look at the, uh, the cord that goes from the monitor to the Apple IIc. This thing has got to be like 12 feet long, at least maybe longer. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to test the monitor. If that works, then really the next step is just to clean everything. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the monitor on and see what happens. Okay, well, the power indicator came on, so hopefully that means something. Uh, let's go ahead and turn the 2C on. Hey, there we go. And there's the summer games. It looks pretty good. Brightness works. Seems to be centered. So there we go. Let me turn this down a little bit. Oh, yeah, we need to... <laughs> One more thing to do. We just need to uh, put a little deoxid in that pot. But yeah, that looks really good. I know it's going to be hard to see on the screen. I'll see if I can get some better pictures here. But uh, it all seems to be working just fine. So now that this is working, I think I need to go ahead and start scrubbing away and clean up the, uh, the Apple IIc and the monitor. It's been a while since I've done a cleaning montage, but let's go ahead and get to it. Now, some people may find this work kind of monotonous, but I actually find it kind of relaxing. So let's put on some music and get to work. Okay, the first thing to do is to remove the keyboard again, which is pretty easy because they included this IDC connector, which is a lot easier to get out than those uh, flat flex cables that were in some of the older systems. The next step is to get one of these key pullers if you don't have one already. It is possible to take the keys off without the key puller, but this really will save you so much frustration and a lot of broken stems from your keyboard if you use one of these because it allows you to pull the keys straight off the keyboard without um, uh, bending or, or, or breaking them. And it only costs a few bucks, so it's well worth the investment. You just put the key puller around the keycap and pull straight off, holding very firmly on the key puller and the key should pop right off. As you can see, these keys are really dirty, not just on the tops of the keys, but all around the sides. It's one of those things with this uh, chiclet design, you know, the dirt kind of uh, gets around the sides and you really need to scrub that away. So I've set up a couple of bowls here, one with warm soapy water in it and another one with uh, fresh water that'll be the rinse after I scrub these with the toothbrush. You're soaking in it. In dishwashing liquid? <laughs> it's palm olive. Now some keys like the space bar and sometimes the carriage return or shift keys will have a supporting bar underneath. Uh, it's called a stabilizing bar and you need to pay special attention when you're taking that off. Uh, you can easily break the little plastic pieces that hold that bar in. So take a close look and see if you can remove it very carefully and uh, take note of how it was put in so that you can put it back in when you're done. Now, the Apple IIc's came with this rubber mat that went under the keys. I, I guess this was to keep things clean and try to protect the key switches from crumbs and, and such. But actually, it gets it breaks down over time, and uh, actually the pieces from the rubber can actually fall in the key switches, causing more problems. So I'm going to be removing that and this other underlayment that was underneath the rubber mat. Once all the keys are removed, it's time to start scrubbing with the toothbrush. You don't really need to let the keys soak most of the time if they're not uh, soiled too, uh, too much. So just grab a toothbrush, get some suds going, and start scrubbing. Sometimes I like to sit in front of the TV and do this because it does take a while. For all of these keys, I think it took me about 20 minutes to do all the scrubbing and get each one really clean. 
Don't forget to clean each side of the key and even the back. Remember, if somebody spilled coke or something, that could have found its way to the back of the key. Also, make sure you put a towel down because, uh, yeah, this is going to get a little messy here. So I'm all done with the keys and it was hard to capture this on camera, but this water is definitely filthy. So you can see all the dirt that came off those keys. Now it's time to rinse the keys off and I have lost more than my fair share of keys down the disposal. So I've learned my lesson. I always stop up the drain with the uh, stopper and then I use a little strainer to rinse off the keys really well. Once that's done, it's time to dry the keys off by spreading them out on a towel. Yeah, pat them dry and I usually let them dry overnight. Okay, it's the next day and it's time to start working on the rest of the case. You need to pay careful attention to any tabs that are on the case, as they might break off if the plastic is brittle. Uh, this case also has this mesh cloth on the top of the case, which I'm going to have to be careful of as I'm cleaning. But that mesh probably did save a lot of dirt from getting inside the Apple IIc. Now all this case needed was a little bit of warm water and some elbow grease to get all of that layers of dust off the top and uh, the few smudges that were left on the sides. And that mesh dust filter that was, uh, looks like it was uh, bonded quite well to the plastic. So I had no problem cleaning that up and really uh, getting the water in there. So it didn't come off. So if you have one of these, uh, try cleaning it with a little soap and water. It should hold up quite well. And don't forget to use that toothbrush to clean out any of these little grooves along the top. Now for the bottom case, uh, removing the main board was easy enough. You just unscrew it and it comes right out. However, I found underneath that there was this paper separator as well as a metal RF shield that needed to be taken out. The paper separator was somehow bonded to the case through the RF shield. So I had to use a screwdriver to just kind of uh, pry it loose because I did want to keep this. You don't want to put the RF shield back in without having something to protect from shorts from the main board to the RF shield. While I had the main board out, it was time to put a little deoxid in this volume pot. Just need to spray a little bit in there and uh, wiggle it back and forth a few times and that should uh, loosen it up and prevent all that crackling. And I just wanted to point out, here's this little metal bit here that's part of the spring mechanism for the handle. These little things can often come out while you're cleaning, so pay close attention to those. If you lose that thing, it's going to be hard to find. After washing the case, it was time to do a little reassembly, being very careful to line up this board. It's pretty easy to get that off just by a little bit, and who knows what damage that would cause once you turn the machine on. Now it was time to reassemble the keyboard, and it's always handy to have a picture of the keyboard available to you. There are many variants, so take a picture before you start, or make sure you can look up a picture on the internet to use as a reference as you put the keys back on the keyboard. Before I put the keycaps on, I used a little deoxid to lubricate every key switch. Because the keys were a little bit stiff, and this will help loosen them up nicely. Then you can just press each key into place. Just press it firmly, it should snap on. And through the magic of video editing, this keyboard is reassembled. Next, it was time to turn my attention to the disk drive. Of course, you need to take the floppy disk out. Uh, and then it's really just the faceplate that's dirty. The, the rest of it is fine. So I just used some Windex and a Q-tip to get into all the nooks and crannies. Putting the floppy drive and the keyboard back in place is pretty straightforward. Just don't forget to put the handle in before you put the top lid on. Well, I had to go digging for a coin to actually disconnect the monitor from the stand. It's just got a simple coin screw type thingy. Um, but it actually is a pretty neat design. The base is very heavy and the monitor pivots just on that little pivot point and you can tighten it up to uh, keep it in place once you have it at the right angle. And with the base removed, you can see how this particular stand is built to fit this exact monitor. Those grooves on the top there fit exactly into this little monitor and probably wouldn't fit any other monitor. And with the base removed, it was just up to a little Windex and a little bit of scrubbing to get all of the dirt off this monitor and get it ready for an eventual retro brighting. And after a trip to the sink and a deep scrubbing, you can see how much shinier the base is and the monitor looks great too. So with these types of projects, it's hard to understand the progress you've made unless you go back and look at some of the original photos. Here's the system we started with. 
The Apple IIc looked like it had been stored probably in a very dusty garage and uh, definitely wasn't stored in a box because this thing was absolutely filthy. And here's what it looks like now. The difference that just a little elbow grease makes is quite dramatic. Here's what the system looks like when it's all put together with an Apple ImageWriter 2 alongside and a mouse. And even though the monitor still needs a RetroBright treatment, you can see that just by cleaning this up with a little Windex, it looks way better than it did. Well, that Apple IIc really did clean up nicely. And uh, I can even do uh, one of those uh, marketing ploys here by holding this thing above my head now, uh, <laughs> just like they did back in the old days. Now, when I first got my Apple IIc, I just got the computer and the power supply, and that was it. No software, no monitor, nothing else. And I really didn't want to wait to get, uh, to say, purchase some disks from the internet. I wanted to figure out a way to make them for myself. So in part two, that's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you how to make your own disk starting with nothing but the Apple IIc and a power supply, and we'll see how far we get. You might need a modern laptop to help you out, but this is going to be a really fun way to make your own disks from scratch starting with nothing. So if this, uh, if like me, this Apple IIc is the first retro system that you bought and you don't have any software, not to worry, we're gonna cover that in part two. I'm also gonna take a look at the board, the special add-on board that's in here, the so-called fingerprint board, uh, which lets you do screen captures directly to a printer. And I just happened to pick up that Apple uh, ImageWriter 2 that you may have seen in the last part of the episode. And I'm gonna see if I can get that up and running so that we can test out this add on board and see if it actually prints, does a screen print for us. Um, and so that'll be a lot of fun too. Uh, if you like this episode, hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. It helps the channel a lot. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram or um, uh, Twitter as well. I post in between episodes, some updates and things that are going on, going on. Sometimes I post some pictures of Penny who's over here getting into trouble as I can see. Uh, so I've got to go take care of her. But um, anyway, please do all that. And until next time, thanks for watching. If you want to support me on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash retrohackshack and sign up. End of line.